welcome back for part six of our series on the match. In part five, we discussed Jung versus AMC, the lawsuit that threatened the NRMP's very existence. And we discussed how, under the threat of this lawsuit, the NRMP began an extensive public relations campaign intended not to convince people that the match was legal, but that it was good. And we covered how academic hospitals, facing the possibility of a judgment that might run into the billions of dollars, lobbied Congress to end the lawsuit, culminating in backroom deals that led to the sp a specific antitrust exemption being added to the 2004 Pension Funding Equity Act. The secret deals and 11th hour amendments that came out of the Senate, they did two things. Number one, they settled the issue once and for all about whether the match is legal. It most assuredly is. Before 2004, probably not. After 2004, the match is absolutely legal. But it also removed the public's ability to debate these issues and weigh in. And that left one important question unanswered. Was the match a good thing to have or not? And that brings us to part six. Would we be better off without the match? In this video, we're going to answer this question by critically evaluating some of the claims about what would happen if we didn't have a match. And once we've considered all those claims, then we'll make our final verdict. The first claim, without the match, applicants will face early and exploding offers. You hear this claim from people who believe in the match. They say, without the match, we'll go right back to the bad old days. It'll be just like the 1940s all over again. And it sounds plausible, right? I mean, these early and exploding offers, that was the problem that the match was created to solve. But you know, a lot has happened in the seven decades since. Remember, back in the 1940s, there were nearly twice as many residency positions as there were new doctors to fill them. As a hospital, if you didn't fill your positions early, you risked losing out in a very high stakes game of musical chairs. But these days, there's a lot more applicants than positions. Every program gets more than enough applicants to fill its spots. The average general surgery or internal medicine residency program gets around 100 applicants for every position that they're trying to fill. So what reasonable basis is there to believe that hospitals are going to start offering second-year students like they did in the 1940s? Look, in 2021, there were 48,700 match registrants. And those people were competing for just 35,194 PGY-1 positions. Programs don't need to out-compete each other to be sure that they're going to fill. There's plenty of applicants for everyone. I see this concern as being very much overblown. That's not to say it's completely untrue. It's not. I mean, one thing the match does do is it imposes a certain standard schedule on residency recruiting. It's logical to assume that once that schedule is removed, programs are going to recruit when they want to, and, and everybody's calendar is going to be a little bit different. Um, some programs, I'm sure, will begin offering applicants sooner. But are we so sure that'd be a bad thing? I mean, many students would be happy to have their future path solidified a little sooner. When you find out where you got to move in mid-March, it doesn't give you a whole lot of time to get your life in order before you got to start punching the clock for 80 hours a week. Remember, this match system that we have, it, it evolved in a different era. I mean, back in the early 1950s, almost all doctors were men. I don't know how many of them had spouses that worked outside the home, but probably not very many. Things are a little different today. I think many medical students might appreciate early offers. But yes, if, if some programs began offering applicants earlier, it would force applicants to make decisions before they know the full slate of options that might be available. But again, so what? I mean, life's full of trade-offs. When you choose your parking spot on a city street, or when you match with someone on tender, or when you accept your first contract as an attending physician, you never know if you might have gotten a better option if you'd held on for some indefinite length of time more. But there's a cost to waiting. Some people value that cost a lot. Some people don't. So why don't we just trust the market to work things out? I mean, after all, we simply do not see early offers upending job markets in other areas, even when jobs are extremely in demand. I mean, sure, Google wants to beat Apple for the best software developers, and Goldman Sachs wants to beat out J.P. Morgan Chase for the most promising new investment bankers. But you don't see those companies offering jobs to college sophomores. 
the problems that occurred in the 1940s, they took place in an era when there was a major discrepancy between worker supply and demand. It strains credulity to believe that we'd see those same issues to that extent now. Now, would less prestigious or more difficult to fill programs offer applicants a few months earlier in order to outcompete their peers? Sure. But I think, like in every other market on the planet, it seems logical to expect that we'd pretty soon reach a comfortable equilibrium. So my final verdict on this claim is, it's true, but we're not going to see early and exploding offers like we did in the old days. Moreover, to the extent that early offers occur, I think we've got to fairly acknowledge that many applicants would view that as a feature, not a bug. Let's move on to the next claim. Couples need the match. I mean, after all, it's hard enough to get one residency spot. It'd be awfully hard to get two simultaneously, right? Couples, they might be screwed if we didn't have the match. I mean, this claim has the ring of truthfulness, but does it withstand serious scrutiny? Well, I mean, look, medicine is hardly unique in having couples. And, uh, you know, there's no couples match for any other occupation, but somehow people seem to make it work out. I mean, this observation alone ought to be enough to cast doubt on whether this is a true assertion. Moreover, as nice as a couples match is, it only helps a certain type of couple, those in which both partners are in medicine and they're both graduating in the same year. The match has no solution for couples who are out of sequence with each other academically or in which one partner is not in medicine. And those couples have to navigate the job search just like any other couple in the United States. And although Americans have among the highest divorce rates in the world, I don't think that the lack of a universal occupational couples match is why. In reality, the couples match evolved because of the constraints imposed by the matching system. The match itself was never created to solve problems for couples. So I'm going to rate this claim as half true. Dissolving the match would make things harder for certain couples. But then those couples would have it no worse off than any other couple that's already ineligible to participate in the couples match. Let's move on and test our next claim. Without the match, programs will engage in bad behavior. People who make this claim usually point out correctly that there's a power differential between programs and applicants. And they say, you know, without the protection of the match participation agreements, programs might pressure applicants to reveal their preferences or accept their offers. And it's true, you know, the NRMP's match participation agreement does require a certain code of conduct and they do investigate and punish violators. But you know, the NRMP is not a police agency, so already lots of low-grade bad behavior goes unchecked even now. Still, more to the point, the type of conduct that the NRMP regulates wouldn't necessarily need to be regulated if there was no match. I mean, you don't have to outlaw asking about the other party's rank order list if there is no rank order list. More importantly, even if the NRMP's regulations disappeared, applicants and programs still have the courts contracts, societal norms, the long-term benefits and penalties of the free market, all those things could help enforce certain standards of behavior. In other words, we still have all of the things that seem to effectively regulate hiring in every other industry. So again, my verdict is going to be that this is overblown. I mean, it is true. The match participation agreement does allow the NRMP to impose a certain higher standard of conduct than might otherwise be required. And I think that they should go farther with that and outlaw more types of bad behavior than they already do. But to claim that we need a match because without the match participation agreements, programs are suddenly going to start abusing applicants, I just don't see it. And I don't think you have to look any farther than any other industry that doesn't have a match to see why that's a little bit of an overblown claim. Let's move on to our next claim. Residency selection will be chaotic without the match. <coughs> you mean more than it already is? I mean, do you think applicants are going to apply to more programs if there wasn't a match? Do you think applicants are going to hoard more interview offers? I don't. I think it's fair to say the match lessens some forms of chaos, but it probably increases some others. I mean, in a free market system, once you interview for a job you like, you probably slow down. In the residency selection market, you keep interviewing just in case. 
you know, until you get so bored of it that you can't possibly take any more interviews because the finality of the match is still months away. Sometimes the need for a match gets explained by the observation that medical students graduate all at once and all residency positions get filled simultaneously, which leads to a congestion problem. But even that claim still ignores the fact that, you know, medical schools are hardly the only schools to graduate people in the spring, and yet in other industries, the free market seems to work okay. I mean, new attending physicians all finish residency and fellowship at the same time, but there's no match for real doctor jobs. Why? It's both fair and truthful to acknowledge that the match makes the process of getting a doctor's first job more organized. But I'm very skeptical of the claim that residency selection is so different than every other occupation and every other market that removing the match will lead to this, this unbridled chaos. So again, I'm going to say this verdict is false. Let's move on to the next claim. Residency selection will be inequitable without the match. The claim here usually says that without the order of the match, residency selection will just go back to the, the days of good old boys networks and backroom deals. And this is a concern that I can tell you resonates with a lot of people. But is it true? So let's take just one step back from the matching process for residency selection and see what we see. I mean, there's no match for medical school admissions. There's no match for post-residency jobs either. And I doubt very many people, if they're being honest, would say that either of those systems are fair or equitable. But is residency selection really better? Really? I don't think so. I mean, if you ask me, the sad reality is that everything about a career in medicine, from your pre-med years all the way up to getting promoted to being a full professor, every single thing favors people who have more traditional measures of privilege whether that's the color of their skin or how much money they or their families have in their bank account. I can't say that the match makes any of that any better. Even when I squint, it's hard for me to make out how the match makes that better. Now this claim here, this, this argument is one that I usually hear from pro-match hardliners. There's a handful of people out there who, um, because of their beliefs or their aspirations or their employment, they assert that the match is an untarnished good. And these people are seemingly incapable of leveling or even tolerating even mild criticism of the match. They're unwilling to admit that the NRMP has ever erred or that any aspect of residency selection might improve in a post-match world. But folks, you know, the match isn't magic. It cannot and it does not fix every problem. And it certainly doesn't undo centuries of institutional racism and wealth inequality in our country. It's a clever idea, sure to allow applicants to be able to consider all the residency offers they receive without being forced into an early commitment. But it's a clever idea. Nothing more, nothing less. So this claim that residency selection is made more equitable by the match, I wouldn't reject it out of hand, but I can't accept it either. If I'm being honest, I got to say I want this to be true. But when I look at the residency selection process, I can't say that it seems any more equitable than selection into any other stage of a physician's career that isn't subject to a match. Now, you could try to argue that historically excluded and underrepresented groups would be even more vulnerable in a free market system. I mean, maybe those applicants would feel obligated to take the first offer that came along and more privileged applicants would, would have the courage to hang in there and wait for a better deal. That might be the case. But if you want to make that argument, I think you've got to fairly acknowledge that the match also may enable a certain degree of racism. I mean, in a free market system, you've got to stand behind your hiring decisions. You see a program that's made up of all white dudes. It's obvious how they got there. That's who they invited. That's who they offer the jobs to. In the match system, the match algorithm provides a smokescreen and a program can claim, well, you know, of course, of course we ranked underrepresented candidates. They just went elsewhere. It's just the mysteries of the algorithm. My point is this. There are real issues with equity and residency selection, just like in other areas of medical practice. Those issues are deep-seated and they're not going to be fixed by a, a matching algorithm, no matter how elegant. This brings us to our next claim. Without the match, resident salaries and working conditions would improve. 
The idea here is that without a binding match process, prospective residents could hold multiple offers simultaneously, and they could use that as leverage to negotiate better contracts and make more money or get more humane working conditions. I mean, this is the, usually the biggest argument advanced in favor of abandoning a match. And I don't think it's true at all. If you think removing the match would suddenly allow residents to call their own shots and negotiate better pay or better hours, I don't think you understand basic economics. Remember a few minutes ago when I showed you that there were almost 49,000 match registrants and only around 35,000 intern positions? There's more supply of residents than there is demand. And in any market, when supply exceeds demand, prices don't rise, they fall. This is a hard pill to swallow. And whenever I talk about this, I get a lot of negative feedback from people who really do not want what I just said to be true, but it is. So I'm gonna linger on the logic here for just a minute. And if you're someone who believes that residents would be able to negotiate a higher salary without a match, listen up, I'm about to save you some embarrassment in the comments section. I hear people tell me, yeah, but, 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 but programs want the top applicants. I mean, the Harvards and Stanfords, they're not going to stay the top program unless they keep attracting the top talent, right? And if you want the top talent, you're going to have to pay for it. On first pass, that logic sounds appealing, right? Um, but accepting it requires that you ignore several lines of logic and evidence that suggest that this would not occur. The first piece of evidence is that it has never occurred. I, it just is simply not the case that residents have ever negotiated effectively for higher salaries. I mean, think back to episode two uh, in the years when, when the match was being formed. If ever there was a time for residents to demand higher salaries, that was it. There were twice as many program positions as there were applicants. And yet that did not occur. And maybe, maybe that was a different era. I mean, we're talking about the 1950s. I mean, maybe people thought about their careers in a different way than they do now. Maybe it was too unseemly to ask for money. Or maybe applicants simply value prestige more highly than they value the amount of money that they could realistically negotiate for. In any event, it just simply has not been the case that the top applicants ever have demanded more money and forced the hand of the top programs. That just has simply not occurred. And like I said, I mean, 70 years ago, that's a long time. I mean, maybe, maybe looking at the early days of the match is just not valid anymore. And I'll grant you that. But there's one other place where we can look to get some data. Because although we've had a resident match for 70 years, we haven't always had fellowship matches. And there was a time when some specialties had a match for their fellows and some didn't. And it provides an interesting natural experiment to see, did specialties that didn't have a, a fellowship match, were, were those applicants negotiating for higher salaries? So what I'm showing you here is a figure from that article. And you can see that in some internal medicine specialties like cardiology or pulmonary disease and critical care medicine, they had a match. In other specialties like GI or endocrinology, they didn't. Salaries were just the same. Now you could argue that these data aren't applicable. I mean, maybe the existence of some matched fellowships suppress salaries in the ones that didn't have a match. Maybe residents' expectations about what they'd earned in residency tempered their expectations for what they might earn as fellows. You could make those arguments. I mean, these are 20-year-old data. It's a different system. But what's hard to deny is that it's another data point that shows that even when residents had the chance, had the opportunity to, to negotiate for higher salaries, they just didn't do it. Maybe things would be different today. I mean, maybe if all applicants had the opportunity to negotiate their residency salaries, maybe they wouldn't make the same mistakes as their forebears. Maybe they would um, drive a harder bargain. Maybe things would turn out differently. Maybe. There's no data here that can, can help us with that decision. Instead, we've got to have a little thought experiment. We've got to imagine what would realistically occur in the marketplace as it stands now if someone wanted to negotiate for a higher salary. So let's do that thought experiment. Imagine that you're a top applicant and you're applying in a top field, like for example, neurosurgery, and you know your worth and you're gonna drive a hard bargain because you know the top programs, they wanna have the top applicants just like you. So what's gonna happen when you have that conversation with the program director, when they come to you and they say, wow, you're a top applicant, we would love to have you in our program. And you say, well, I would love to be here, but, uh, but I'm gonna need an extra $10,000 or actually this 80 hour work week, I don't like the sound of that, how about 60? 
what do you think they're going to say? They're going to say, next. Remember, you're applying in a field where 20% of people go unmatched. The differences between those who succeed and those who don't succeed are small. What I'm showing you here are data from the NRMP's charting outcomes in the match. It shows you the profile of applicants who matched in neurosurgery and those who didn't. Look at the differences. The mean USMLE Step 2 score for those who matched, 252. For those who didn't match, 248. The difference in research experiences for those who matched, 6.1. For those who didn't match, 5.2. You think the program director is really going to notice a difference between somebody with 0.9 more research experiences or four points on USMLE Step 2 CK? I don't think so. And before you try to tell me, oh, but that's neurosurgery, that's an extreme example, that doesn't apply to such and such area that I would be making my negotiations, I want you to take a step back and then zoom in and look carefully at the residency selection ecosystem in whatever area you think you'd be negotiating. Because regardless of what that area is, whether you think you're going to be negotiating for academic positions in a competitive surgical subspecialty or community positions in a primary care specialty, whatever that is, every program gets more applications than they need. Every program fills with applicants that are nearly indistinguishable from applicants that didn't match there. So if you're someone who fancies yourself to be a top applicant, I think you need to take a humble look around. And remember, we have a system in which thousands of medical graduates went unmatched. They didn't get any residency position at all. And thousands of other applicants, they got a position, but it wasn't in the specialty that they dreamed of or it wasn't at the program that they dreamed of. Maybe they didn't even get an interview at that program. How many of those people would do your job for 90 cents on the dollar, 80 cents on the dollar, 50 cents on the dollar? How many people are out there who would do your job for free? And before you say, but, 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 that's illegal, that's illegal. The point is not whether it's legal or not. The point is that that number is non-zero. And before you try to tell me, oh, but those people, they aren't as good as me. They're not a top applicant. You got to remember that, uh, you know, 90% of the performance at 50% of the cost still creates value. And programs are going to recognize that. Most of you get it. When I put this out as a poll on Twitter, 97% of you correctly recognized that in a world in which every resident could be replaced by someone virtually indistinguishable from them, programs aren't going to say, let's negotiate. They're going to say, next person up. That's why when I hear the claim that without the match, resident salaries and working conditions would improve, my verdict is that's absolutely false. That brings me to my final verdict. On the question of, are we better off with a match than we would be without? I say we are. Now look, the sky wouldn't fall if the match disappeared, but um, getting rid of the NRMP isn't going to turn residency selection into the land of milk and honey either. On balance, I think we're better off with the match than without it. Most of the arguments about the doomsdays that would occur without the match are way oversold, but the most important argument in favor of dismantling it is naive and illogical. The NRMP does make residency selection more orderly than the process would be without it. It allows applicants and programs the ability to consider all their options before they have to make a decision, and I think that almost certainly leads to more benefit than harm, although there are certainly some applicants who would do better in a system where they could make deals early. And although I got faith that the market would establish a workable equilibrium if we had a world without the match, I don't have any faith at all that the free market alone would lead to better salaries or working conditions when we live in a world in which the supply of potential residents far exceeds the demand for them. Now here I want to be clear. The current residency selection process is stressful, and it's inequitable, and it's cruel, and it's chaotic. But I think if you analyze it carefully, the stress and inequity and chaos and cruelty, they aren't caused by the matching algorithm. These problems are external to the match itself, and they deserve careful attention and improvement. It's just that eliminating the match won't do it. A lot of the criticism that we level at the match, I think, is more appropriately directed in other areas. Like I suggested earlier, the match is not magic. It's a neat solution to a very narrow problem. That problem is, how do you let applicants consider multiple offers simultaneously instead of having to respond to them sequentially? It's unrealistic to think that the matching algorithm is going to solve every problem in residency selection, or to think that blowing it up is going to solve those problems either. 
If you care about making medical education and residency selection better, and make no mistake, I do, we've got to direct our advocacy elsewhere. If you're concerned about chaos and congestion, then we've got to deal with application fever. If you're concerned about fairness, then we need to quit relying on these corrupt convenience measures of merit, and we've got to reconceive of what merit in medicine really looks like. If you're concerned about the number of unmatched physicians, getting rid of the match won't give even a single extra person a job. Instead, you need to advocate for better GME funding so that we can train the right size of physician workforce to care for the patients in our country. And if you care about improving resident salaries and working conditions, dismantling the match isn't your best move because the NRP is not your enemy. Your enemy is the corporations that use you as cheap labor to support billion dollar clinical care enterprises while arguing with a straight face that their residency program is a financial loser. The trouble here is supply and demand. An individual resident is replaceable, but that doesn't mean they're powerless. And if you care about this issue, I'm going to have more to say about it on my side and maybe in these videos soon. And with that, our six part series on the match comes to a conclusion. Thanks to everyone who took the time to watch. See you next time. Thank you.